Hi, and this afternoon's chat is all about ADHD and other childhood behavioural issues and how we can feed our kids correctly to help alleviate some of these symptoms. I'm talking to Dr. Rachel Gow of Nutritious Minds. How are you? <laughs> I'm good, actually. Not too good. shabby. Yeah. Good. 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 Yeah, okay, down here. The weather's a bit ooh, te temperamental. It's like thunderstorms and like Armageddon vibe. But apart from that, you know, we yeah. get a lot of fresh air. So well, it's good. lovely and sunny actually in London today. We've had <laughs> warm weather for a few days. It's glorious. Yeah, it's really nice. <laughs> oh god. Right. Well, anyway. I'm sure I've got a lot of um, interested parents and obviously, yes. I mean, this, this affects us as grown-ups as well, you know? Yeah. Um, so what I wanted to fire into straight away on that note is, are behavioural issues genetic? And, you know, is there a way to sort of have a look at them on, because I know uh, Dr. Amy Yasko, I read her book years ago, really interesting book on the genetics of symptoms like ADHD, yeah. ADD and everything. Can you elaborate on that and clarify some of your thinkings and findings? Yeah, I mean, it's a, a kind of a complex question, but ADHD mm, is one of the most heritable of all. I don't like the term psychiatric, but that is how it is classified according to the DSM-5. So it's one of the most heritable of all psychiatric conditions. The genetic inheritance is around 70 plus percent. But that then... And, still... that, and, and is, is, is that, I know it's a weird one, is that come from, is it predominantly from the mother or predominantly from the father? Where, where's it going down, the maternal or the paternal line? Or have they not found that out yet? It could even be from the grandmother. There has been some research to suggest that if uh, a parent or grandparent has bipolar disorder, then the child is 50% more likely to have ADHD. So we know that there are genetic mutations or variations which can give rise and are linked to many different types of psychiatric conditions. With ADHD, as I said, it's around 77% the genetic inheritance in terms of our DNA, but that does leave a proportion which is then accounted for by the environment. Um, and what I mean by environment is that could be anything from infectious diseases or toxicity during pregnancy, or it could be uh, nutrition. And that's where my focus is in terms of nutritional insufficiencies. Um, you know, there, there are many, many contributing causes. You know, some argue that it could be, you know, deprivation, kind of physical trauma. So it really does range. It's probably likely to be um, an epigenetic effect. So, you know, genes are no longer kind of deterministic in the way that we thought they were the blueprint for everything. I mean, yeah. clearly stuff like height and eye colour is very fixed. Um, but in terms of behaviour and personality irregularities and, you know, symptoms like ADHD, um, there is a proportion that we know is accounted for by the environment so it's not just the dna does that answer the question yeah yeah absolutely it's just nice yeah. to know it's not necessarily something that has come out of the blue you know and you no. can often if you have a child that's behaving in a certain way you might be able to follow it back a couple of generations or in in, in siblings or, or even distant relatives and you can see where it is so it's kind of like less isolating for me anyway yeah. to know that you know they yeah. got on so my kid can as well yeah i just wanted to actually touch on your story because you yes. were a super successful estate agent weren't you <laughs> yeah like, you, were, you, you know you're just on buying event. houses out of st john's wood and everything yeah. living that that london dream and then yeah you had a son didn't you can you explain what happened to you and how you went from super estate <laughs> agent into neuroscience which is quite a leap yeah huge monumental um yeah so basically i was a young mom a busy working mom i worked like you said on abbey road in st john's wood quite close to the emi recording studios i had a, a fabulous time um, running a, a very busy estate agency um, and yeah I got to meet some incredible people and life was good I got my son into a, 
a small private school um, called Abercorn Place, which I don't think exists anymore. But um, he was there. And um, then slowly, slowly, I, you know, I began to get loads of phone calls from the teachers and there was just endless complaints that he wouldn't, you know, sit still and he was fidgeting. He wanted to doodle all the time. He blurted out answers. He didn't put his hand up, you know, and wait to be invited to give the answer. And um, this kind of low level disruptive fidgety behavior just kept getting him into trouble. And yeah. it also caused concern for me because as I said, I was, you know, I was a single mum as well. So, you know, and I had a very busy That's career. Good. Yeah, and I was working long hours and it was, it was super tough without the additive of, you know, endless phone calls, uh, you know, request to pick him up. And, um, and anyway, in the end I thought, you know, I really have to do something about this and, um, I I think a special educational needs teacher at the school kind of suggested that I went to an educational psychologist. And then that kind of began this huge pursuit from educational psychology assessments to uh, clinical psychology to child and adolescent psychiatrists. And eventually he was diagnosed with ADHD and mild dyslexia. Because right. oftentimes ADHD doesn't come in like what's called a pure case so ADD or ADHD it normally comes with something else um and it may <clears throat> back then my son was also quite aspergery because he would like literally like uh, know all the planets in the solar system and their proximity to each other and to earth and when he was like three he'd be like how does a light bulb work mummy you know like, like oh, oh. <laughs> And I, I was not equipped to ask. Google. I know. I used to buy him like the Guinness Book of Records and all those kind of encyclopedias and just to kind of stimulate him. But back then yeah. they didn't do dual diagnosis. So basically, yeah, after all those investigations and I found out what was going on with him, um, I was um, offered sort of psychostimulant medication, um, you know, Ritalin, basically. And I was really opposed to it. But... Yeah. Um, by this stage, he had left uh, Abercorn Place and he was, he was actually um, at a boarding school. And um, I was requested, well, I was told um, by the boarding school. And the reason he had to go to a boarding school was because um, it was a specialist school for children with ADHD and dyslexia because there was just no help. I found that there was no help. I had to teach myself educational law get him back then what's called a statement of special educational needs, which is now an education healthcare plan, which I then kind of used to pay the school fees um, <clears throat> because I, I was so scared that he would be failed educationally because yeah. he was getting into all this trouble. And yeah. uh, so he went to this boarding school and uh, they were like, literally you have to medicate him or we will, um, or he can't, yeah. So my hands were tied and although it did help, um, it did benefit him in the way that he was able to better pay attention and concentrate, that there was no doubt there. Um, but he had quite serious side effects. So he was sort of constantly like just wired all the time. And, okay. and I was like, there has to be a better way. And he wasn't sleeping and his appetite was suppressed. And I just knew I couldn't continue down that route so I actually um he did end up leaving that school and we started looking at alternative um options and a friend said to me you know have you tried omega-3 fatty acids and I was like what on earth are they you know yeah. <laughs> and um yeah really everything that happened to my son kind of inspired me to start studying and researching you know when it you is a motivator isn't it your kids do I mean they do I mean I might, you can imagine you're there s selling multi-million pounded house in St John's Wood living that London dream and yeah. then all of a sudden you're looking into fish oils it doesn't correlate does it but kids make you yeah. do that you know they shift yeah. your focus like like medication you know yeah. they, they, say, they say when you're a parent to a child with any type of special educational uh, need you become a better investigator than the FBI you literally like make it your job to know everything yeah, yeah. and that's yeah. what happened and I decided actually to give up my career in property altogether I had to abandon it there was no choice um because I needed to devote my time to to, to my yeah. son and um yeah so I basically went to uni and I started off part-time you know just sitting in on lectures a couple of mornings a week 
and I obtained a Bachelor of Science in Psychology, which then led to Master's of Science in Psychology, which then led to a PhD at the Institute of Psychiatry, um, the Department of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry at King's College London. And I started carrying out my own clinical research, looking at nutrients and their effect in um, children with and without ADHD. So in terms of their brain activity, and in terms of their behavior. And that really just, you know, was the kind of the start of my own clinical research. It took me over to America. Then yes. I did brain imaging research, again, testing. Uh, in this case, it was omega-3 fatty acids. And uh, yeah, in, in the brain activation of adults with ADHD. So it's a nice a nice transition from working with children and teenagers to, to working with adults. I mean, that's another s subject because there's so many of us of our generation that, of course, would just get school reports all the time saying they don't focus on the class yeah. plan, they don't listen, they need to be... Because I used to absolutely shit myself after parents' evening as <laughs> I'd just see my mum yeah. thunder out the school and go, sit down, lady. And I'm yeah. Like, yeah, but, you know, it's, it's so tricky to focus, you know, but it, it is, you know, I, I don't think I've got severe ADHD. I've definitely got a focus issue, but I do, I do take Amigas and I don't know what my focus is like nowadays because I'm looking at something I'm actually interested in. Yeah. But for a kid who's not necessarily interested in maths or English or whatever, it's, it's torture, isn't it? You know, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, they have this amazing ability to hyper focus. So when it is something they are really passionate oh, about, yeah, they, have, they have this amazing ability to hyper focus so when it's something they're really passionate about they can literally be fixated on whatever it is until completion I mean that's the kind of gift side of ADHD yeah um, I think that's what we need to be able to focus on yeah and because they're the guys who, who are the next Steve Jobs they're the guys who are the best architects in the world and you know we just need yeah. to I mean, I think the whole, the, the way our school system set up is a little bit torturous, yeah. unless you're that type of kid that enjoys it. You know, school totally. can be really frustrating, particularly for the parents. Yeah. I mean, this homeschooling. Yeah. Oh my God, I've been freaking <laughs> out. Yeah, I've only I mean, got like eight plus to deal with, you know? Oh my gosh. I know. I think um, mainstream education squashes creativity, especially for our neurodiverse children who, as you said, are... Um, you know, among the, the greatest inventors and writers and entertainers yeah. and actors and, you know, yeah. a lot of them There's are a lot in the creative arts who, who do that, you know. Totally. Absolutely. Okay, so I wanted to crack on a bit. Yeah, So sure. we've got your, so we know you've been there, yeah. you've done it, and you've done it too. <laughs> Worn the, the extreme. It says something about you anyway, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Definitely. Okay, so I, can you just explain in layman's terms about the dopamine receptors and the transporters and how that can become an issue obviously we've got genes that predispose how we detoxify our dopamine or yeah. don't can you explain that in a really simplistic way um yeah i mean i'm not a geneticist um, so that's not my area of specialism. but what i will say is i just want to talk a little bit about the brain because i think it's what's okay. my area of fascination yes yeah, um and i will definitely touch on dopamine um, so a lot of people don't know when I go into, you know, I go into schools and I speak to teachers or I present at coffee mornings for parents. Um, one of the first questions I ask everyone from the children to the teachers is what is your brain made of? Because so many people just, you know, they don't know. They're not quite sure, you know, what this three pound massive jelly type substance is actually, you know, what is the composition of the brain? And it's important from a nutritional perspective, because if we understand what the brain is made of, then we can make sure that we provide the fuel in order for it to function optimally, to switch on attention, elevate mood, keep us focused and... Um, yeah, so basically the, the brain, you know what the brain is made of, don't you? <laughs> so the brain is made of these specialized complex and unique fats called lipids. So 65% of the dry weight of the adult brain and retina is made of fat. And, you know, when you say the, the F word, word, I know the F word, it always has such a negative connotation, yeah. but there are so many different types of fats. And these omega-3 essential fatty acids, our body and brain literally cannot function without. So they play a critical role in every significant um, biological process throughout the central nervous system. So we need, and we're utterly reliant on a dietary intake of them because we cannot make them and they're not stored fats um, that 
have omega-3 and the richest source really is uh, fish and seafood. So I just want to break that down a little bit more in terms of neurotransmission. Yeah. So neurotransmission is that process you were talking about in terms of cell signaling. It's the chemical messaging that occurs in our brain without us even thinking about it. You know, it's happening rapidly. Um, and well, is this powered through electricity? Yes. So it governs, our, yeah, it governs everything we do and it's occurring just constantly, you know, yeah. without us even thinking about it. So basically each of the neurons in your brain, um, you have, it's estimated that you have over 100 billion neurons and each of them is coated in this myelin sheath. And that myelin sheath is made up of docosahexaenoic acid, also yeah. known as DHA. And what that does is it speeds up cell signaling across your neuronal networks making for faster and more efficient communication so basically professor john stein he's a neuroscientist at the university of oxford he has estimated that children who don't have enough or adequate dha because they're not eating enough fish and seafood which is the richest source their cell signaling is slowed down by about 30 percent wow yeah. That's, that's monumental. So a yeah. kid in a classroom who isn't getting, mm. not, not EPA, this is just about DHA, isn't yeah. it? Because we'll move on to that yeah. in a second. So they can be 30% slower just on their diet alone than yeah. the kid next to them because yeah. the other kid next to them has good quality DHA. Yeah. And that's frustrating for that kid, I guess, because he knows the answer or he or she knows the answer eventually, yeah. but it's just not getting right the way there and out and hand up in time. That's why. Right. Not the confidence, I guess, as well. Absolutely. And we know yeah. that um, there's been pu research published in The Lancet, which has showed that low maternal intake of omega-3 in pregnancy um, what they've done is they followed up the children. Um, it's called the ALSPAC study, uh, which is conducted by the University of Bristol. And there are, there's a massive, massive data set with, I think, more than 16,000 pregnant women who signed up. And mm -hmm. the health and the development of their children has been charted ever since. And what they found was that low uh, maternal intake of omega-3 um, later resulted in a wide range of differences in terms of uh, suboptimal developmental outcomes like lower verbal IQ, lower pro-social skills, like a whole range of things. And the scary thing for me is when I had my son, you know, I uh, somehow, it, the message that had filtered into the public domain was kind of avoid fish and seafood. Like I had no idea. I had no idea because, you know, mercury contamination, a lot of scare marks. Well, I mean, it's, it's like I, I used to, when I was pregnant with the boys, mm. I, um, number one, I avoided the seafood because he was my number one. And then yeah. I think sushi became fashionable with number two. Yeah. And I was eating lots of sushi at the time. And then obviously we get a lot of information from America. It's like, you can't eat seafood. Da, 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 da. And then I just thought, what the hell are they doing in Japan? Yeah. And let's yeah. just have a look at the IQ I in Japan compared to the USA. Yeah. But I'm off to have some sushi, thank you very much. <laughs> you yeah. Know? Yeah, well, so, the US has actually changed their dietary guidelines on the basis really? of the, um, a lot of the researchers that I worked with at the National Institutes of Health, because they actually did a whole kind of risk, you know, cost-risk analysis of the literature. And in 2015, the US um, changed their recommendations to I think it's 16 ounces of fish and seafood uh, for mums during pregnancy to preserve the neurocognitive outcomes of their unborn children. So they've completely turned it around now. And obviously there are certain Can you fish imagine? Fish, you know, you like just want to sue them, right? Avoid. But we need omega-3. Our brain and um, visual system is made up of that. You we were talking earlier about dopamine. Yeah. And the next the mechanism of um, action of omega-3 um, is also on uh, the production of dopamine. So we need omega-3 also to keep our mood in check. And there's been so much research around um, depression and omega-3, yeah. postpartum depression, it's been shown to prevent yeah. postpartum depression. Also, it can take up to five years for your brain to recover 
it's DHA omega-3 content after a pregnancy. So a lot of people don't know that it takes a while to get your brain store going um, because the mother is depleted of her omega-3 during the last trimester. There's this biomagnification preferential uptake of omega-3 depleting the mother, the mother's brain to, to form the building block of the baby's brain and retina. That's how it works. Yeah, yeah. So, so omega-3 is great for mood as well. It's brilliant. You know, it's so important um, for the production of dopamine. And there's been a huge amount of experimental studies showing that depleting, you know, cell-cultured sort of neurons to, to laboratory animals um, of omega-3 has resulted in a 40 to 60% depletion of dopamine. Okay, so let's yeah. just explain the dopamine. <laughs> dopamine is that drive, that sort of ambition, that get up and go and that yeah. sort of like, let's do this, let's do this project, yeah. let's, I don't know, let's run this race, let, let's do whatever. It's that yeah. energy you get that obviously yeah. so many of us get addicted to anyway. But yeah. to have it to have it in natural abundance, you wouldn't reach out for substances where you get it from, like your drink, like your drugs, like your, I don't know, erratic behaviours, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, so basically dopamine, exactly what you said. Um, the, the most dopaminergic neurons uh, are in the ventral striatum, which is the region of the brain. It's the reward hub of the brain, if you like. And... Um, yeah, these dopaminergic neurons are responsible for our responses to reward and to pleasure and are critical for motivation as well. And we know through the work of uh, Nora Volkow, who runs the National Institute of Drug Abuse, she's the director, uh, she does a lot of brain imaging research in addictions and also in ADHD, and she's shown that in adults with ADHD and independently those with high impulsivity and those with addiction have a deficit of a specific dopaminergic neuron called D2 receptors. So the volume of these is lower. Mm. And so you can't get that, that <clears throat> connection. So you get low dopamine. So you don't, so you yes. hunt out for it artificially, I guess. Yeah. So behaviorally that will respond in if you take a child of ADHD, for example, like they don't really respond uh, to rewards in the same way that their non-diagnosed kind of control or counterparts do. So, for example, kids of ADHD, you know, they want their reward immediately. Yeah. So if you kind of say to them, oh, you know, if you tidy your room, um, I'll give you £10 at the end of the week, that's going to mean nothing to them. You know, that's not how their brain works. They want the immediate reward in the here and now. And there's been a lot of my own research, brain imaging research, looked at reward processing and it's looked at emotion processing and it's looked at differences. And it's also looked at whether things like omega-3 can, you know, mediate the behavioral response to a reward. Like how, how can we change this behavior and can nutrition play a role and what is the role that nutrition plays in improving um, behavior because when you lack motivation can you imagine how impairing that is like you said at school they can't they're not motivated to do their work it's a huge uphill struggle for them and then they get told off on top of that they're being reprimanded for the behaviors that they literally have no control over or little control over. So they're constantly kind of in this negative cycle of punishment and being reprimanded, criticized. And, you know, I always used to say to people, if, if you had a child like who had a physical disability, you wouldn't be kind of telling them off of yeah. it. But yeah. yeah, because it's kind of ADHD and depression, you know, they're, they're often invisible. The symptoms are not always immediately recognized and a lot of people just think that these children are, are naughty and they're deliberately misbehaving and that's such a misunderstanding and we need a lot more empathy and sympathy for the struggles the daily struggles these kids have okay so just moving on from that so we kind of get the the, the the brain the dopamine it's happening and yeah. whether you understand it or not if you've got a kid with adhd how do we mitigate these symptoms or how do we <clears throat> sort of, until they find the right avenue of career path or partner or whatever they're destined for, 
how do we make their childhood as comfortable as possible? And bearing in mind, yeah. we've got teenagers and fussy eaters and the whole shebang. How, I mean, I've got so many kids who only want beige foods, <laughs> yeah. only want sugar. What is yeah. that about? I know, it's so uh, tough. You know, I think any parent of, of, who's raising a child with autism or ADHD, like seriously pat yourself on the back, I salute you. You're not alone. It's, it's a tough, tough job. And I, I always say that special children are giving, given to special people. Um, so, yeah. So which one should we look at first? First of all... Okay, well, I mean, important. let's see. I, I've got here, I've just, I've, I've kind of correlated yeah. all the questions. Great. Okay, yeah, so great. I've got a couple that are the same. <laughs> yeah. um, basically, she's got fussy eater. Yeah. What supplements are easy to take or put in food? And another one who said, I've just got a child who just will not try anything yeah. new, literally wretches at the sight of new food. What can we do? Yeah, it's a very, very common one. Um, yeah. Children with ADHD and autism um, tend to be extremely fussy eaters, and they also are overrepresented in terms of food allergies and food intolerances. And what my kind of personal theory on this is, and this is why I believe that oftentimes they just want the white foods, you know, so white potato, white rice, white chicken, yeah, bread, rice, yeah. all the crap. Is in a, in a way, um, what we have found, and a lot of research has, has found this, is altered gut um, mic uh, uh, bacteria, so microbiota. So basically, they have um, what they've done is they're almost like providing the fodder to grow the unhealthy bacteria, and that's you know we have a little ecosystem in our gut. And so that's the gut brain axis then yeah that's right so basically our gut health is critical and um it's the gut is called the second brain you've heard of, you know this terminology and with the discovery of the vagus nerve we realized that serotonin is actually being made in our gut over 80 percent of serotonin is being made in our gut transported via the vagus nerve directly into the brain so what through my research and through you know just going on PubMed which is a huge clinical database of every single you know published research trial what um what has been shown is that um these diagnostic labels come with an increased risk of food intolerances food allergies nutritional insufficiencies and 100% of my clients with these diagnostic labels have all of that. And then what happens is the kid is trying to normalize its own brain function. You know, we are master manipulators of our own brain's biochemistry. So like you said earlier, we're doing things to like release dopamine because remember the clinical research has shown that these children and adults don't have enough dopamine. You know, and that's, there's a lot of research supporting that. So what do you do to release dopamine? Well, sugar. That's number one, quite refined okay. sugar, dopamine, feel better in an instant. That's why they develop problem eating and these rigid, you know, behaviors, because it's, as I said, it's a whole relationship, you know, <laughs> with, yeah. with the brain and the gut. And, and um, what we have to do is, is basically go right back to basics. So with my son, I literally had to, work so hard to take you know the food that he'd been eating uh you know for years away and start again you know start so was your son on doing the reaching for the things because if he was at boarding school i guess you didn't have the control over his nutrition he'd be reaching for things like lucas aid after sport or during sport crisps chocolate mars bars the whole sh i mean when i was away at school i was living on white bread with pot noodle in it yeah and then like sandwich. 75 grams of sugar in Lucas aid. You know, people don't realize, you know. Um, so yeah, we need to kind of try and manage those addictions um, if they have developed, you know, in terms of sugar cravings and wanting, um, you know, to spike up their glycemic index, basically. That's what sugar does. So it creates- They're doing that not because they're crazy it's because yeah. they're after dopamine they want to feel yeah. motivation they in feel their good. bodies that, yeah. that they want to feel good yes yeah. right that's okay. it in a of course sugar will give you depleted returns as you get older so yeah. basically the trade-off is you'll end up probably obese 
because you're eating that much sugar to get that yeah. dopamine. Hence why you'll end up with weight issues and then the knock-on effects of that heart issues, blah, 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 blah. So the problem is now, how do we get that dopamine release mm. or help with that pleasure for a child who's yeah. found through self-medicating as we all do eventually through alcohol or drugs or whatever through our you, you know our pathways how do we stop the child in its tracks now yeah and spin it on its head so they find their sweet spot without the sweet yeah i think it's really important like number one the first thing i did was can literally empty my kitchen cupboards of everything containing like sugar basically high fructose corn syrup all of those hidden nasties you know at the end of the day if you don't understand the food label put it back or research it before you buy it that's my kind of like go-to advice you know like lucky Char charms has 37 ingredients like seriously why don't you you know try scrambled egg and you know find find different uh, healthier options for breakfast because what happens is you know the kids eat a pack of haribos on the way to school and then as soon as they get into the class they've had that dopamine sugar high and then of and course this is, this is what happens so they're getting fluctuations in cognition and mood and they're going to be irritable um you know they're not going to be able to concentrate they're not going to be able to focus so it impairs their learning as well it actually, and for, imagine a child of ADHD who's already struggling to focus and then they've got all that sugar. You know, we know that sugar activates the same reward circuitry of the brain as class A drugs, yet we're giving it as treats to kids. We're bribing them with it. You know, oh, if you do this, I'll take you from McDonald's or, you know, or it's crazy. It's like, you know, Professor Robert Lustig, who you met, he says yeah. sugar is the alcohol of the child. You know, and kids yeah. of ADHD do have an increased risk of developing addictions later in life. So we have to be super careful with them. Yeah, and I had to go back to basics. Oh, yeah. I had to start researching, you know, and, um, you know, took away all the squashes, the diluted juices. You know, you had to have 100%. Yeah, like even the fruit shoots, you know, parents are thinking, oh, it says fruit. It's not, it's yeah. never seen an apple. Clever it's never been on a tree. I mean, it is clever marketing, and it gets me so mad me too. that people part with their hard-earned cash to yeah. pay for essentially a marketing team who are driving around in Range Rovers and stuff, but they're not <laughs> buying a decent fruit, they're buying the marketing and the advertising, people, mm. massive supercars, etc. And it's being able to just go, hang on, I'm being one of the, I'm just a sheep here. Yeah, and, you know, yeah. It, yeah, it is. Okay, so we... Now then, so what we need is, so the kid is screaming out for sugar. Your son's going, I want this. I want my Lucas A back. I want that. What did you give him instead of the regular medication he was on? I'm assuming you took him out of the boarding school and switched it up your own way. You did yeah. your own research. So basically, as I said, I changed his diet completely. I did an elimination diet as well. So, yeah, the rewards were huge. So... Um, what I did was I, I removed wheat, uh, gluten, because of course gluten can uh, prevent the body from absorbing nutrients. I removed all fizzy drinks because they, the phosphoric acid binds the nutrients and flushes them out of the system. So I removed sugar. I introduced fish as well, salmon. Luckily for me, my son enjoyed salmon. Um, I just changed his diet completely. I also gave him multivitamins. Um, probiotics are really important to improve gut health, and you can get them in little yogurt drinks. Um, I restricted um, dairy as well, but didn't completely el eliminate it. That was pretty tough. Um, I guess you still have butter. I mean, you're just... Yeah, butter is actually... The big hormone. I mean, I suppose the industrial... Uh, I mean, I don't give my kids... I think you know this. I give my kids raw milk if I can find it because of the the, the bacteria in it, I think, yeah. is a superfood. But I won't go to a supermarket and get a pint of regular milk or semi-skimmed. I'd go for a, 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 a nut milk yeah. and make sure it has no sunflower oil in, make sure it has no fillers in and no sweeteners. It has three ingredients in, some cashew nuts or almonds. Yeah some water and some Himalayan salt. That's all Perfect. they need. Yeah. You shake it up, you know? Yeah, yeah. But but you so know many people, like, people just don't do that. Yeah, they, they, they don't. See, they, they see the label, yeah. 
but, and they see like a green vegan yeah. leaf on it, all of a sudden they assume it's, it's healthy. It's yeah. in Greg's. How yeah. can it be healthy? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, this is it. literally all I drink. Sorry, I'm not advertising Tesco. <laughs> this, this, I get through one of these every single day and, and normally more. And if I want a juice, I make it myself in a Nutribullet. You know, I just blend my 60% veggies and 40% fruit and it's delicious. It like boosts your brain. It like bombs it with everything you need to, for the day. So, yeah. So, uh, um, but uh, one thing with my son, what I did just to get that yeah. in there, I did a reward chart. So, right. you know, I gave him incentives which were non-food based and that's really important. As a psychologist, I tell parents that a lot. You know, you need to find rewards which are non, ideally non-food uh, based and also um, non-screen based because kids are also using like Playstations to, you know, get their... Dopamine. Artificial dopamine, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so I would, um, also I enrolled my son into everything imaginable from stagecoach to boxing, to athletics, to gymnastics, to trampolining. We had a massive trampoline in the garden that he could go on. We had a boxing um, bag that he could yeah. punch, you know, because kids of ADHD are more likely to be impulsive and to impulsively whack someone. So hence I had a boxing bag set up in the garden. <laughs> And it was brilliant because, of course, boxing is wonderful. You know, it's a high-intensity cardio workout and it releases any tension and stress. And they need to vent. They need something, you know. So okay. managing... That, would that be because of the dopamine is just hanging around and it's not hitting the, the, the receptors? I suppose it's hanging around causing that, that, dis, that, I, that disturbance, I guess. Yeah. It's like, because if, you, if, if it's not being used and, like, transported to the right places... Mm -hmm. You've still got it in your brain or, or your body or something. It's, it's a hormone, isn't it? It's going to be making you angsty, like PMT. Yeah. And also these kids with ADHD tend to be more anxious as well. They kind of, their fight, fight flight response, that whole parasympathetic nervous system, can be um, activated. Uh, so basically they, they, they can be more prone to feeling anxiety, which can... Um, lead to uh, aggressive behavior as well um, it, yeah so give us so good just give us a handful of rewards that work with your son so again like I said um oh my gosh I'm going back years now because he's an adult <laughs> um it was something like for example if there was something he wanted to do like an activity he wanted to do or but what I would do in the short term in terms of immediate rewards is I would like put together a little bag of all his favorite things, like whether it was Lego or, oh, I can't even think of examples right now off the top of my head, yeah. but I would have a reward bag. I'm a big fan of bath bombs. Oh yeah, yeah. I think back then it was like Pokemon and Japanese manga stuff. So I'd like get the things he liked um, and he would have his reward yeah. chart with the expected behaviors um you know and he would literally put his sticker when he completed a desirable behavior but on my website Davinia is all of this is up there so if anyone is interested in how to use positive behavior techniques with their ADHD or autistic children please go to drrachelvgal.com and there's a whole section on on this so you know because I'm sort of struggling to think of it's been many years. He's of course like, you are. Of course. He's six foot um, tall now. Okay. <laughs> yeah. And a happy, productive member of society. Yeah, so, you know, awesome. it's, it's yeah. great to hear, actually. Okay, so getting more specific now um, yeah. regarding the supplements, because I know so many, uh, so many of us want to just know, what shall I give them? Where do I buy them? What yeah. brand? Because most of my followers know there's a ton of shit out there that you yeah. could be buying once you yeah. go into the packaging. And where do we source these fish oils from? These yeah. people who are vegan as well. Can you explain what they should be doing? Yeah. All right. So I'll touch on that briefly. It's a question I get asked all the time. Um, I don't particularly endorse products. It's something I don't ordinarily do. But what I can... But what uh, can we look at? Or on that label yes yeah, so it could be anywhere yeah. on the planet i want to be able to go like that okay that is that type of fish yeah it's wild etc etc what are we looking for because if you just have something with a nice fish and an eskimo yes. on yeah oh yes. that's right but it might be a load of bollocks yeah that's right but i will say that the 
the uh, oil that I used at my NIH clinical trial, the brain imaging trial, was called Barleen's Organic Oils. Um, so Can you spell that for me? Just I'm gonna I'm gonna yeah. I'm gonna write it all down yeah. for everyone. But just yeah. go ahead. What what is it called? Um, B A R L E A N S Barleen's Organic oil um but it's only made in the u.s and it's like a smoothie emulsion it's 100 percent natural and we've got great compliance because it tastes amazing and it's all natural ingredients and it's uh like a yogurt consistency and you can keep it in the fridge and um my son was taking a thousand milligrams a day of fish oil and that really helped him when he was around 12. he literally said to me mommy i feel happy that was like oh, oh yeah broke your heart yeah yeah so, um, and I noticed that he was like noticeably um, less hyperactive, but we didn't just do omega-3s. As I said, I, compl I did so much work and I also benefited from going to this place called The New School, which was in West Hampstead, which was yeah. instrumental in teaching me how to implement positive behavior techniques. So my son also took multivitamins. Um, it's really important because as I said, all the children that come to my clinic, all of them have whopping great big nutritional insufficiencies. So their nutrient levels are way below recommended daily nutrient intakes and they don't okay. even know. If you yeah. don't have a blood test, how do you know? You yeah. know there are so many brain selective nutrients, yeah. you know, from zinc to iron to iodine, magnesium, selenium, you know, we can go on and on. You know, and it's like children, all of these work in synergy. You know, so you can't, if you take omega-3, but your background diet is full of junk processed refined foods, which can take omega-6. Omega-3 is not going to get through, is it? Yeah. It doesn't make a dent. So it's like you really need to watch your intake of linoleic acid, which is in soy oil. Can, can you explain about <laughs> linoleic acid, what well, foods yeah. we find it in, and yeah. why we've got to avoid it? Because yeah. I have this. And also, flaxseed is an omega-6. Yeah. Is that okay to use? I mean, I'm thinking of vegans and stuff. I mean, or is that just to swerve it completely? So, no, I mean, the brain, in terms of the biochemistry of the brain, it's also made up of omega-6. So it's yeah. important to understand that omega-6, uh, like arachidonic acid, for example, is the body's natural response to injury. So when we injure ourselves, we have a wound, it becomes inflamed, and basically, it's alerting us that we have this wound that we need to tend to in order to heal. So we need omega-6, there's no doubt about that. But what's happened is omega-6 linoleic acid is, has infiltrated every commercially manufactured processed supermarket foods, from cakes to pastries to biscuits to pizza, you name but it. not milk. We are eating 12 to 17 grams of linoleic acid um, in the average uh, Western diet or the, the SAD diet, standard American diet. And we're having way too much. And what um, researchers who work in the field of nutritional psychiatry have um, hypothesized is that this omega-6 is switching on inflammatory markers in the brain, placing the brain in a chronic state of inflammation. And there's this consensus among nutritional scientists and nutritional um, neuroscientists in particular, that underlying all psychiatric ill health is inflammation of the brain. So many people that subscribe to this theory. So what we need to do is reduce our intake of linoleic acid, yeah, yeah which is the head of the omega-6 family. To just clarify, yeah. we need to cut out uh, your sunflower oil, your rapeseed oil, uh, canola oil. Um, let's see what else is up. Use what olive oil because it's a monounsaturated fatty acid, so it's healthy. Okay, you know, so the monos, I, the I, 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 I just look out for when I'm on a label, and, you know, I mean, Waitrose, Sainsbury's, Tesco's, yeah. whatever, I'll just spin the yeah. product around. If I see sunflower oil or rapeseed oil or canola oil, it goes back. And so I, if it's... Yeah, uh, and that, that, that's, that's what I do is well, I cook in avocado oil, yeah. I, I use extra virgin oil, olive Perfect. oil, salad, and I drink loads of MCT yeah. oil. And on top of that, I'm taking fish oils as well. Perfect, because... Um, so, yeah, but what about the flaxseed oil? Because I'm getting told to have flaxseed in my diet as well. Yeah. Flaxseed's healthy, yeah. 
It's healthy, um, but yeah. So, so we're okay to use that on salads as well. I mean, we don't cook with it, of course. But. Yeah, I mean, it's the basically it's the cheap refined vegetable oils, you know, that uh, that have often gone through a, a hydrogenation process as yeah. well. Then you know, yes. trans fats we know are killing people quite literally. Even yes. the NHS has an article on their website about trans fats, amazingly, which I'm really happy about. Um, so yeah, so basically avoid all those cheap vegetables. You know, I I personally just love extra virgin olive oil and have it in abundance. <laughs> you know, yeah. but yes, all the others you said are perfectly fine and. Salad, because the trouble with the, the trouble drink. the trouble with these vegetable oils, the trouble with these sunflower oils, they're, they're very very cheap, and they were actually made for machinery yeah. back in the fifties. And then there was a whole heart healthy campaign uh, on the back of that. On the, uh, basically, it boomed the agricultural um, industry in the USA, and a whole new industry was was founded yeah. on the back of heart health sunflower oil, vegetable oil, <laughs> being healthy. And it's yeah. the actual opposite. There's a, yeah. there's a divvy called Ansel Keys who's responsible for all this mismarketing. Yeah. But, yeah. That, but my rule of thumb is stay away from sunflower oil, stay away from vegetable oil, stay away from canola oil. If you, if you see any of those, just walk away from the product. It's gonna turn, it's, it's turn nasty into you. Ignore yeah. all that marketing. The, the message is changing. Yeah. And stick with decent animal fats, obviously organic animal yeah. fats, like I use butter. And, um, and olive oil and avocado oil. And yes. That's, that's, a, that's a kind of rule of thumb. Okay. So where oh, we just had a question here. Sorry. Um, is the Barleen's Omega-3 lemon cream? No. The one that we used in the clinical trial was key lime. And it's, i tell you why, because it's a highly concentrated uh, formula that contains 1,500 milligrams of EPA and DHA. We haven't spoken about eco-sepentanoic acid which is EPA but that's been found in clinical trials to help with both depression and ADHD in fact the literature is quite robust showing uh, a small to modest effect size in reducing clinical symptoms of both of those conditions um, so yeah isn't that isn't that isn't there a study coming out saying that that they actually <clears throat> improve depression over and above antidepressants yeah so that was published in the British Journal of Psychiatry in 2015 with some of the members of my team at the NIH. And what it did was it, did a, it was a meta-analysis or like a kind of pooling together all the clinical data um, from, from patients that had um, been given EPA. And what they found was an effect size of 0.6, which means, you know, 60% of patients improved taking EPA, omega-3. And if you look at, if you, if you compare that to the effect size of psychotherapy, which is about 0 0.20, so about 20% of patients receiving psychotherapy or cognitive behavior ther therapy would improve. And then if you consider the effect size of antidepressants, which is around 0.31, which means around 31% of patients will go into remission after 14 weeks with a SSRI. So you, so that effect size, you know, 0 0.60 is double that of um, psychotherapy and uh, antidepressants. So that yeah. is incredible. And no one knows. Right. Doubling your chances to feel yeah. that. No wonder I feel better now than I did when I was an antidepressant when I first yeah. got sober. I feel better now because I'm actually using nutrition. And it took my mother to die for me to realize that nutrition had an actual impact on how my brain yeah. worked because we're just constantly fed messages. You yeah. need Domino's, you need McDonald's, you need chocolate and all this bollocks. It's just, it's awful. It's literally genocide. Well, remember, that's exactly it. Like we're kind of, you know, uh, I think we should also remember that these food giants, you know, they're as big as the pharmaceutical industry, the weapons industry, they're, they're a global, you know, entity that are making billions. And um, through keeping us addictive, if you like, in my opinion, because, you know, they have the top food scientists in the world who have you know, very cleverly concocted just the right amount of, yeah. you know, salt and, and sugar, etc. Uh, this chemical concoction, which keeps us coming back for more, and then, of course, makes us ill. And then what happens is when we go to our doctor, they're not going to say, what do you eat? You don't even get that question.
question. You know, you're, no, you're what, literally... what is the hostility um, with the <coughs> regular health service that, you know, we all love and obviously they're doing an amazing job at the moment. But is it just too big a subject for it to be brought into? I mean, do we need to break up our sort of GPs into specialists, particularly because we've yeah. got chronic disease, we've got behavioral issues on the increase. I think there needs to be a nutritional department for metabolic diseases. Absolutely. I would absolutely love that. I mean, to see that in my lifetime would be phenomenal because um, the BBC covered this actually quite bravely and um, publicly announced that, you know, medical doctors received about two hours training on nutrition. So all of their knowledge is pharmacological. So that's why you'll be written a prescription. You won't be sent off to see, if, you know, what your vitamin D levels are or your omega-3 levels or all of these we know uh, can help depression. You know, you might be told to exercise, and you know this isn't a criticism because, of course, as we've said, no, it's just a amazing. We love them. The subject, and it's an but, ever evolving subject. So you can't possibly expect one guy in yeah. his stud, in his uh, who, who graduated twenty years ago, to know what's happening, uh, what you're doing over in the states yeah. yesterday. That's right. The and communication's I not there. Do you know what? I mean, I, I actually teased my doctor recently because we were talking about that study that you mentioned. And I said to her, I said, you know, what's the effect size of an antidepressant? And to be honest, she didn't know. And so I, I wanted to share that information with her because like you said, you know, I am constantly in training. I am constantly learning new things. I would never pretend to think for one minute that I, you know, and I think the thing is, like, why are we not doing continued practice? Why are we not branching out? For me, personalised medicine is the future. You know, there's not one size fits all approach. It has to be a little bit of this, a little bit of that, a little bit of that, and let's put it yes. together. And yes. that's what we do at the W1 clinic. It's a personalised, science-based, evidence-based approach, approach to psychological um, health, you know, and a non-drug based approach. And I'm not saying that drugs don't work. With some people, they can be life-saving in terms of psychiatric health, you know. Um, but my approach... Do you think always... they can work in, t in conjunction with each other? Yeah, so they can. A severe case of ADHD or even a mild case of ADHD and a yeah. parent is just like tentatively trying, yeah. you know, because obviously we've all been brought up with Dr. Knows Best. So you've got your child, you're finally seeing some sort of results. He's focusing or she's focusing better in school. But then you're also reading about and listening to conversations like us. Can the two intermingle? And then can you slowly sort of cross over as you, as you because it's hard to take a kid off the drugs and off the sugar and off everything and when yeah. it's all they've known all their life since little. Yeah. yeah, I think you've got to find what works for you at the end of the day. You know, you really have what works for you and your child. Um, I will always subscribe to nutrition and exercise as being uh, neuromodulators, you know, yeah, enhancing brain for me. Yeah, it works for me. So I try and do that with my kids as well. I wanted to get your take on CBD and how, I mean, obviously that's uh, now we've just over the past few years just got access to it as an actual yeah. legal chemical to work with. What are you saying? And also, it's an open question. I wanted to know what studies you're looking at at the moment for the future. What's out there on the horizon for, for us as parents and for you as a scientist? What are you finding? Yeah, I mean, I do think the whole research into um, cannabis oils is um, proving to be promising in some instances. You know, there has there is research going on right now, at the, or maybe it's finished, but it was at the Institute of Psychiatry, King's College London, where they were giving kind of the medicalised marijuana to adults with ADHD. I'm waiting to find out what the results are, so I don't actually know. But certainly there are research trials um, taking place all over the world in, in this arena. Um, you know, when I was at the NIH, they were looking at oxytocin and all sorts of things, you know. Um, so, um, I mean, the future for me um, is we've already seen the field of nutritional psychiatry just grow and grow and grow, you know. So... Yeah, I mean, I'm really excited about that. And I'm I'm so happy that people are kind of going full circle, if you like. You know, they're saying what else is out there, um, which is great. You know, we have to move beyond the prescription pad, is my point. 
yeah. what's your other question again sorry i was just saying what uh, what studies are on your what what are on the horizon for, for your industry yeah. really it's just nice to know what they're looking into like you said oxytocin i didn't even yeah. think of that you know that's that hormone that you get that love hormone that feeling of connection bonding. Yeah. it's a bonding one and i suppose that kids with adhd maybe have a depleted level of it i don't know yeah, I don't know enough about it, to be honest. Um, but yeah, the CBD research, uh, there's a company called Canna CBD. And um, I Canna. Have, yeah, look them up. They're really good. Um, you might have met them at my last event. Uh, they were there. Tim um, is the guy that runs that, Canna CBD. And uh, they've got some really interesting products right now as well. Um, but yeah, obviously, clinical research is so important and that we continue, you know, but it's not always the kind of, the thing is, unless it's been tested for a randomized placebo controlled clinical trial, you know. Which is so tricky because we're talking food here. Exactly. And we're talking, you can't, and that's why you've got to do it yourself, really, I yeah. think. Yeah, you've got to. Yes, exactly. Food you've got to get those amigos. You've got to, you've got to pump the kids full of amigos. You've got to take away the sugar and you've yes. got to implement decent exercise. It's hard work, but God, you know, what's going to be harder? Your kid ending up in a, mm -hmm. in a, in a, in a, in a life that they don't like or yes. feeling even worse when they're 25, 35. I mean. And also the whole concept of life isolating one single nutrient doesn't even make sense to me you know because as, as we touched on earlier they all work in synergy and a, a lack of one will impair the absorption of the other so that's what's not really understood so it's very hard to do clinical research isolating nutrients but it it does happen <laughs> you know not so always just, just to summarize because right, we're going to get cut off in a minute i mean i yeah. talk to you for hours yeah so if um if somebody came into your clinic mm -hmm. would they receive a, a blood test mm -hmm. because i'm just thinking about when i took my kid to another clinic there was no blood test there was a questionnaire that i filled in yeah. and his school got something to fill in and she didn't speak to him and boom i got offered drugs Wow. There was God. no blood test. There was no sort of like behavioral observations. And there was no genetic test. I asked her about that and she looked at me like I was talking something from <laughs> Star Wars. I, I looked like I was talking Vulcan. But yeah. so and we've got two minutes left. Br briefly, just tell me the okay, test. So basically through. what I would do is send them to a laboratory that I work, work in close partnership with for a full nutritional evaluation. We would look at food intolerances, food allergies, nutritional insufficiencies. I would also do a full cognitive, you know, assess uh, to see what's, the severity of symptoms that they have pertaining to whichever condition they came uh, in with. So yeah, I would do all the preliminary screening. I work alongside a top award-winning medical doctor and psychiatrist who handles the diagnostic side of it. And then I would create a personalized, you know, tailor-made approach in terms of nutrition plans, correcting all the insufficiencies, you know, helping them get through in terms of the food intolerances and any allergies they may have and incorporate fitness. You know, I work with Lisa Nash, she's an amazing personal trainer. And, oh, yeah. Boxer, yeah. and they would be with me for at least two hours, like that, the initial consultation is two hours. I'm very thorough and very in-depth. And I also have a book coming out at the end of this year, which is Smart Foods for ADHD and Mental Health. So oh my God, amazing. Funny. That's fantastic. Yeah. Oh, well, tell me yeah. when it's out and, I, and I'll post it. <laughs>